future telescopes, future missions, all this stuff is, is actually totally impacted by what we're going to discover with the James Webb Space Telescope. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? The James Webb Space Telescope is now happily sitting at its vantage point on the stars at L2. And now the painstaking process of unfurling, aligning and calibrating the instruments to look into the dim, distant, ancient reaches of our universe has begun. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we can't get some intriguing first glimpses of what the telescope is seeing. And on February the 11th, NASA indeed released the first composite images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope of an Ursa major star and also a cheeky mirror selfie. So to help us dig into what we are seeing in those pictures, why they're important and what the road ahead holds for James Webb Space Telescope, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by a phenomenal special guest from NASA, Dr. Stephanie Millam. So Dr. Millam, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time. Dr. Millam is a planetary scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and serves as the JWST Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary uh, Science, working in the Astrochemistry Laboratory. She's an expert in rotational spectroscopy, observations, and laboratory modeling of astrochemistry and molecular astrophysics. So... Who better to help us go through these images and uh, understand what we're seeing? So, Dr. Millen, before we get started, it would be remiss of me not to ask, what is it like to be working on such a high profile, much anticipated, exciting project like James Webb Space Telescope? Because I've been hearing about this project since I was an undergrad 20 years ago, and it seemed to be really struggling to get off the ground. It is, um, it is all the things um, you can possibly imagine. It's extraordinarily exciting. Um, there's not a day of excitement um, that doesn't pass by and leave me in pure exhaustion at the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> or even sometimes overnight. Um, yep. there, it's been a long buildup. It's been a long time coming. Um, I personally have been on the project about 10 years now. Amazing. And, um, it's been an amazing experience watching this thing come to life, uh, so to speak, especially now that we have the first image um, actually in hand, so. I've never really thought about that because I mean, there's no uh, there's no sleep in space, right? So it's, uh, I guess it's around the clock uh, work on this project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have people working on our operations center 24 hours a day. Um, they have been since before launch and we are keeping an eye on this thing and making sure everything's working and, and doing what we want it to do. Awesome. So just to just to keep people up to date with exactly uh, what's going on, what is the current phase of operation? So we saw in the news that the, the telescope happily uh, arrived at, uh, at L2 and is uh, sat there unfolding and getting ready. What, what exactly is going on? What's the stage of operations now? Um, so that's a great question. So uh, as you said, we, we are now at our, our final um, place that we are going to be for the next few decades, hopefully. Um, we are a million miles away from Earth <laughs> at, at the second Lagrange point. Uh, we've completely um, unfolded the telescope. We, we've accomplished all of our major deployments. We've um, taken all of the uh, mirrors out of their launch, you know, safe, stowed position. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, and we've even actually powered on all of our science instruments, our cameras and our spectrometers. Awesome. So everything's alive and working and we're in the phase now where we actually start focusing the telescope so we're making all of these 18 segments act and perform like one giant mirror so so any anything that's uh, outside expectations at the moment or everything green across the board for, for where we are everything has been um flawless or what you like to say nominal <laughs> um and it, it it it's actually gone so well that we now know that um we have a fuel reserve that'll give us a longer mission lifetime than we originally anticipated. So we're well in the 10 plus year regime now for science, which is fantastic for those of us, especially uh, those of us that have been working on the project for 10 plus years, but <laughs> the physics community. <laughs> that's uh, that's amazing. That's great news. So, so why, um, you know, there'll be a lot of people out there who are wondering, why does this alignment campaign take such a long time? And 
Why couldn't we maybe have done this on the ground? Is, is it that you had to stow everything away to launch safely? Or is it that misalignments happen during the launch? Why why do we have to get there and then people are so uh, so waiting for the first images, but they have to wait for this alignment campaign? Uh, it's all the things you said. Um, so basically we, we had to fold up the mirror itself to launch it so that it actually fit into the fairing of it. Um, so just by folding it, um, we had to make sure all the mirrors were in a safe position so that they didn't get jarred around too much or knocked, you know, broke anything yep. um, during the whole rocket environment. Um, <laughs> and once we unfolded everything, as I said, we released the mirrors from their safe haven, you know, their little um, locked and prepared stored configuration. So now all these segments, they're, we, we put them in the place that we thought they should be um, just based on what we did on the ground and things. Um, and that's when we collected the first images just to see where they were actually pointing. And that's that first image that you saw yeah. of the, the 18 stars um, yep. sort of scattered across, you know, a field. We're going to, we're going to bring, we're going to bring that up in a second and talk through that in a, in a little bit more detail. <laughs> Does um... it take so long because we, we have to make sure that um, first of all, all these mirrors act as one mm. it's a very iterative process. Yeah. I, we have, move a mirror a little bit make sure the right dot moves in the right way and so we're you know we've confirmed now which which star is which mirror um and then we have to basically put all of them into what looks like the jws hexagon so we all have 18 segments and then we focus them yeah and then they all um, come into one and look like one and then the process it's even more complicated because we have to align the mirrors now with all of the internal mirrors um, that take all the, the extreme light that we collect with this giant gold mirror into the instruments themselves. So, so that's a, that's a, a you kind of alluded to a, a, an interesting question that I wanted to ask. Do, is this does this recalibration is it is it an ongoing process where we have to continuously do this if we want to look at a different part of the sky? Does does the telescope rotate to look at a different position or do we? do we realign the, the mirror segments to look somewhere else? So the whole telescope moves as one solid piece. Mm -hmm. um, we are, um, move the mirrors to look at a different part of the sky. Um, we will check the focus and um, alignment of the mirrors um, just with, as we collect data, um, we'll mm -hmm. see how well things are performing. And we do have the option that we can go back and do a realignment refocus. So I think if like a, a large enough micrometeorite hit one of the segments yeah. and just kind of worked it out of place a little bit, um, we would want to go back and fix that um, as long as the mirror wasn't completely damaged. That makes okay. sense. I, I guess as it's cooling down as well, there's a potential for, for things to change and realign slightly. Is that is that fair? or? Yeah, um, we think we'll have, um, by the time we go through the full iterative process, the mirror should be just about at their operating okay. temperature. It will cool a little bit more um, as we go through the rest of commissioning for the next few months. Um, so we'll we'll keep an eye on it for sure, um, but it's something that hopefully by the end of this three month period, we'll definitely be in the the nice position that we need to be so that we can finish testing all of our instruments and collecting our first science. Amazing, and and you mentioned that that first picture that I, that I did want to talk about. So um, these are the kind of the the first evaluation images, if you want, and you mentioned these these eighteen blurry dots. Um, and this was one of the images that sort of went out to the to the to the global, um, you know, the global press over, and, and everyone else over the over the last week. What what exactly are we are we seeing here, and and why is it helpful um, as a first step to to aligning these mirrors and getting towards that that science stage? So, uh, what you're looking at is um, a, a piece of sky that um, had one extremely bright star that we wanted to do this first. I think we got um, and so what you're seeing is actually the same star, but it's coming from 18 different mirrors. Mm. Think of it as each one of our segments on our primary mirror is acting like it's a telescope. So it's actually the image of the exact same star just scattered around 18 different times. So as I said, now what we do is we identify which mirror is um, giving which, which piece of light. And you see some of them are are blurrier and some of them mm. are um, really sharp and fine. Um, that just has to do with how well they're focused. And so, yeah, now that we've identified each of them, as I said, we'll put them into that 18 segment. Uh, so it just looks like the mirror itself. You can see the picture by, behind me. 
and we'll have them centered and we'll make the smudgy ones look a lot more refined and <laughs> we'll really have a focusing of each one of those 18 segments at their you know 18 well aligned configuration um, then once they're focused we start putting them all together and making them one final image so, so all the stars will come together yes this is that's the perfect video yeah. Um, showing exactly how each of these will then um, will work to to pushing them all into one single star. So, so why did we why did we pick this uh, this Ursa Ursa Major star? Is it is it particularly separated out? It looks in a relatively quiet. I, I don't want to say because you, obviously you can't see all the stars are in the background and such. But is is it a relatively quiet patch of the sky to use for alignment? Why did we why did we choose this particular star to? Uh, to do our alignment campaign with or start uh, with. multiple reasons one um accessibility uh, it's it's in the sky uh, and visible to jwst where we <laughs> so it's, it's always a good um, start right yeah it's a, it's good to, to aim for something you can actually see uh <laughs> not on the other side of the sun for example yeah um, and so and then it's a bright enough star and as you said it's kind of a a less um dense area we we know that there's not a whole lot of um, confusion that's going to come into play when we look at this one particular star. Hmm. And so, um, and because it was bright enough that we knew that we would be able to find it, um, at least on our first try, uh, at least find something. We weren't actually expecting to be able to see all 18 segments on the first try, hmm. especially as tightly compact um, as we did see them. Yep. Um, you showed that we did kind of a mosaic. So we, yes. we took a images and yeah kind of mapped around that star area um and we actually had set that observation to be a lot bigger than what we actually ended up having to do ah, so, okay um all the little dots uh, were a lot closer together than what we um what we we could have anticipated so so so, so we actually uh, having having got to the the position they were actually a lot closer to uh perfect quote unquote alignment than, than we might have been uh reasonably expecting yeah absolutely um and so and even um as i said identifying each which um what speck of light was actually related to what mirror was a lot easier to do than we thought as well and um it it was really amazing uh listening to the engineers that have been working on how to do this for the last you know 20 years uh how they knew like they just they saw the image they were like oh that's clearly this mirror that's clearly that mirror and, and then of course they ran a quick test and confirmed it but they knew they just knew They're, it's like looking at you know a baby picture and saying yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I was gonna say i looked at that and, and you know i'm a, a physicist particle physicist and i thought how the hell did they separate out which one is coming from which bit but Obviously, I'm sure there's been a hell of a lot of time spent on the algorithms to separate these things out. And as you say, if you've been working in it for a long time, you could just look at this and say, ah, OK, I see. Because you've probably seen a million simulations of what it could look like. And you're like, wow, this one's actually um, pretty good. How 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 perfect does the alignment need to be? What's the what are the sort of tolerances there? Is it very, very, very fine adjustments, I guess? Uh, yeah, so I if the primary mirror was the size of the continental United States, if it spanned that distance, yep. we have to have precision in aligning each of these mirrors down to, to the order of meters. Wow. <laughs> so it's really, it's really, really, very, really very fine. fine precision. Yeah. I think I saw something like one ten thousandth of a human hair for, uh, for something to get the crystal clear picture. So yeah. Wow, that is a that is a really nice analogy, and uh, just shows you how fine the the resolution has to be. So it looks like this is all uh, this is all looking good. How how long do we expect until we get to a position where we can start to see these sort of Hubble type pictures and very crystal clear pictures? Is this how is so is, is that is that like time. asking how long a piece <laughs> of string is? I I don't know. Is that a fair question? Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, we still have a, a bit of time. We have a lot of things we still have to do just to make sure the telescope's working as a telescope needs to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we get finished uh, aligning all the mirrors and making sure everything's focused, as well as the mirrors that go to the science instruments, we have four instruments um, that are our cameras and spectrometer we'll, we'll be doing all of our science with. 
And so those also have to make sure they are aligned. We then um, test each of the instruments. We have to make sure all of their modes work. We have to make sure that you know the, the detectors are reading out appropriately. We have to calibrate everything. And that's a whole nother series of, of tests and, and things that we have to do. I say to people that we've- It's we've, about a six month process from launch until we get our first actual images that will be released. So look for the first images, the you know headliner, you know New York Times, whatever, <laughs> uh, come out you know sometime in the summer. And um, I'm sure they're going to be just as fantastic as anything you've ever seen from the Hubble Space Telescope. Amazing. I always say to people, you know, we've been waiting 20 years for this this telescope, so you can wait another another few months for it to be to be up and running, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We have to tell ourselves every day, be patient, do due diligence. <laughs> Don't rush anything. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's, it really is tough. So uh, that's that's one image cleaned up. The other image that we were we were kind of shared with us was this this primary mirror selfie. Now, of course, we all know selfies have a kind of, you know, uh, you know, cultural capital uh, nowadays. People love to take a selfie. Uh, people love to see a selfie. Is this just a cool image or is this really important in helping us to align the camera? First of all, wh what are we seeing exactly? How, how are we how are we getting this picture taken? Where is it being taken from? So this is from our one of our, our main camera called the near infrared camera. Um, and so that's the camera we're actually using to do all of the mirror alignments and things. It has a nice big field of view with the sensitivity and sort of the pixel scale that we want. Um, so what you're seeing is it has a special lens on it so that it actually can acquire an image of the, the primary mirror itself. So that's what you are seeing. You are seeing the AWST mirror. Um, and it's really even cool because you can see like the line on the top. Um, it's one of the, the struts for the secondary mirror. Ah, okay. Yep. And so uh, you are seeing the, the telescope as, as it is, um, which is a really, really cool thing. Um, we have this sort of capability and feature uh, just so that we can make sure that the mirror is actually, or the instrument is aligned to the mirror and the optic of the telescope. And so that's that's a feature that is very very helpful and gives us our first clue as to you know how well the instrument's actually performing, because um, when you collect this first array of you know scattered stars, you want to make sure that you're actually collecting the light in the right way on the yeah. instrument and the detector. And so that's sort of what this was done to do was just to confirm that we are seeing starlight, and that's why you have this bright star uh, or the bright segment that's all lit up. That's because there. Are actually being reflected there. So it's kind and of so, it's kind of a validation that we are seeing starlight. And yeah, a, and yeah. A sort of it's, course it's, overview of what's going on. Exactly. Um, you know, it's looking in the mirror. You're you're making sure you don't have broccoli or something in your teeth. <laughs> and it, uh, so I, I was wondering just how how useful it was for the alignment, or whether it was more a this is the furthest selfie from Earth that we know of kind of thing. But it seems that it it is actually incredibly useful as a as a kind of higher level way of, of seeing that we're we're in good alignment and that things are working correctly it's not it's not yeah, just a gimmick and, and that was put out absolutely and the, this is a, a technique that we'll be using a lot more once we get as i said the the original alignment done um, with all the mirrors and we start aligning things to the instruments we'll be using these types of techniques to make sure um we're focusing things the way we need to that's awesome. So I, I'm sort of coming to the end of the of the questions that I ask, but it, I guess it would be uh, it would be remiss of me not to ask about about your own uh, science that you're going to be doing. So so what sort of science are you hoping to be doing with the the first information from James Webb Space Telescope? So uh, you said you're an expert in rotational spectroscopy and things like this. Are we going to be looking at anything in particular coming from the the data from James Webb? Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm involved in a number of projects. I'm leading a few, um, and also um, part of teams. And science is actually studying comets. So these are the coolest things in the solar system. Um, they are icy relics from when our solar system actually formed. So they're like little. Um, it's you know the frozen steak in the back of your freezer kind of a thing. It's it's unaltered. It's not messed with. It just Back there, um, people sometimes forget about them until you know you have to clean up or your fridge warms up or something. Um, anyway, I, I so feel I feel very seen at the moment. By the way, those are definitely <laughs> in there. I'm going to have to uh, go have a look. Yeah, uh, so um, I have a lot of interest in comets just because it tells us a lot about the chemistry of how 
um, our solar system evolved and maybe where it even evolved from and if there's another planetary system that may resemble the same environment that our planets um, formed from. And so understanding all the things from the planets down to the tiniest pebbles is, is critical in putting that picture together. And it's something that we're now starting to observe in other um, star forming regions and planetary systems. And so by studying comets, we can actually look at the fingerprints of different molecules. So every molecule has a, a fingerprint, you know, water does, carbon dioxide does. And at the JWST wavelengths, we have the sensitivity to really probe and see what the composition of these objects are, whether or not they look like other planetary systems um, or planet forming regions, or even just chemistry that's out in space where stars are being born. And that tells us a lot about how things actually evolve and, and get processed. And you know, if, if everything gets totally cooked and annihilated before planets formed or even life could possibly occur or a habitable world could occur, then um, how much do we care about the composition of the interstellar medium? But if it doesn't, and we have reason to believe that it doesn't, and it's actually preserved and is evolving um, in a molecular sense, um, that's a really cool question and something we've been working on. Amazing. I had I had one one final question that was because uh, we were talking about the, the the signatures of different molecules. Is it possible for us to do anything looking at the the atmospheres of exoplanets, potentially getting an idea more about the the uh, the chemistry that's going on and the and the elements that are in those those atmospheres of exoplanets? Is that is that something we can do with with James Webb and something you might be interested in looking at? Uh, absolutely. It is actually one of our, our, our science goals now is to characterize and study the atmospheres of planets and other um, and other star or planetary systems, as well as even our own. Um, so we'll be doing observations in our own solar system. That was my job on the project was to make sure we can. Um, which tells us a lot about, you know, the composition, the variation of composition of planets and how different they are, the processes that are occurring on planets just by seeing how different everything is in our own solar system. And that helps us when we're trying to interpret data or you know, if we, we observe an atmosphere of another planet and another star system, we don't jump to you know, these huge conclusions about, oh, there's you know, life or something. It's more, oh, there's some process that's occurring on this planet that's causing its atmosphere to look a little different. And what that process is, is something that, you know, we want to dig into, we want to run models, we want to do more observations, future telescopes, future missions, all this stuff is, is actually totally impacted by what we're going to discover with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so um, understanding those processes, whether they're geologic, something like volcanoes or storms or uh, oceans or subsurface oceans or tectonics, who knows? Um, or something even as crazy as life is, is <laughs> a key question. And I think um, we're going to get a nice short list of objects that we really want to study a lot deeper from, from observations with the James Webb. Awesome. I think that's probably a, a good place to leave it because uh, I know you guys are extremely busy and I don't want to take up, uh, take up any, mo any more of your time. I really, really appreciate you taking the time today uh, i really really appreciate it um is there anywhere where you would uh point people to to keep up on what's going on with the james webb telescope keep on uh keep up with what you're working on is there anywhere where you'd like um, to absolutely to? the the where is web uh web page is one of my favorites right now it tells you everything we are doing right now as far as commission it tells you the temperatures of the mirrors down to you know actual phase of commissioning we're in and it's a great way to follow along with what we're doing it also has links to our blog um, that we're releasing where the, these images were actually released um, through and so it, it gives you a nice detailed story and sometimes they're very technical on the engineering scale and sometimes they're just hey look we actually took a selfie with the jwst <laughs> good you need so, you need um, a diversification a of material that's uh, that's a good thing <laughs> Um, but if you Google James Webb Space Telescope, I'm sure you'll find all the things you need. That's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. Again, I really, really appreciate it. And I'll definitely be keeping uh, an eye on everything. All I can say is, as I said to you before we started, um, from contacting NASA, trying to talk to people about this, the, the outreach that you guys are doing and the, the stuff you're putting out to engage with people and make them excited about this project has, has been first rate. I couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have asked for for any better to be honest it's been it's been superb so keep up that fantastic work and uh 
hopefully when when the next big thing comes up we can uh, we can have another chat absolutely um please do keep in touch and um when we get our first images we can just sit there and be mind blown together <laughs> that sounds like a, that sounds like a good idea i'll hold you to that thank you so much again and uh i'll let you go so uh bye for now thank you so much I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.